कैसे हैं आप लोग बेटे वेलकम टू द ट्वेंटी एपिसोड ऑफ नक्शे बाजी आई होप एवरीबॉडी इज डूइंग वेरी गुड एंड हियर आई एम प्रेजेंटिंग टू यू अ न्यू थिंग द न्यू थिंग व्हिच वी आर गोइंग टू टैकल हियर इज सूफिज्म इन इंडिया आई इंटेंड टू फोकस ऑन वेरियस सूफी सिंग्स हु एंटर्ड एंड हैड अ डिसाइसिव इफेक्ट on different regions of uh, the subcontinent they changed the demographic the religious profile completely so i intend to you know and uh, i also have realized that you know throughout throughout we have seen that sufi and bhakti they have been taught as a uh, one topic but i believe that sufism in itself is a very very interesting topic and you should give uh, you know half an hour to it to get a sense Of, uh, of what it actually stands for and what it means and what were its implications so with that thought in your uh, in our head let's uh, look at sufism in india very interesting history it has right uh, this is the rabia rabia of basra the earliest uh, sufi saint a woman right she she belonged to a place called as a basra this is this is somewhere basra right and uh, look at how profound her thought is oh lord if i worship you because of fear of hell then burn me in hell if i worship you because i desire paradise then please exclude me from paradise matlab agar main you know if i if i'm wishing something and then loving you then please reject my wish right rather but if i worship you for yourself alone then please do not deny me your eternal beauty this is the love of a beloved right this is a, this is the that kind of a very intimate feeling which we also notice in bhakti in, in the works of people such as the andal and mirabai right early sufis you know rabia and others as well they were persecuted they were treated as a heretics they were treated as heretics but gradually things began to change another word for uh, sufism is the tasawwuf and the word suf the word suf it means uh, uh, wool oon because they used to wear these uh, wonderful woolen cloth and then they would just go dancing right and uh, through that it became very famous and they came to be known as the sufi they belong to different orders or turuks or tariqas and each of these order they trace their descent from a wali or a teacher and these teachers they they claim to have a successive chain right till prophet muhammad they meet for uh, you know uh, regular spiritual sessions which are called as which are called as majlis right and their places where they hold such meetings are called as khanka take zavia and here they you know they strive for ihsan ihsan perfection of a worship as they understand hadith as they understand hadith right most of the sufi order they trace their you know the origin to to ali talib while certain exceptions of course are present for example naqshbandi they trace their origin to uh, abu bakr the first caliph abu talib if you remember we have discussed him he was the fourth caliph right ali ali talib i'm sorry right so uh, okay moving on initially these uh, sufis were persecuted but then came the wonderful scholarship of uh, uh, ghazali who is known for hujjat 
who is known as Hujjat ul Islam. That means the proof of Islam. He was so scholastic that through his reasoning, through his logic, he was able to make a lot of findings of Quran self-evident. In his early, in his, in, his, in his old age, he started realizing and also accepting in his writing that Sufis are correct. They have a point. And his change of stance changed the game for Sufis. Because after this, Sufis started rapidly expanding in Central Asia and South Asia. And Sufis became so intricately linked with Islam in South Asia that the Indian Islam became very unique. Right? Let's quickly have a look at uh, these the wonderful Sufi saints. So by 1200, right, there were 12 silsilas present. Right? They were either Beshara, that means they would not follow Sharia, or they were Bashara, that means they would follow basic Sharia. Each was under a Peer, a Sheikh, or a Khwaja, right? And they would have a Khanka, also known as the Ribat or Ribat, right? There was a graded hierarchy, right? A, 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 a Bali would have uh, so many Murids. And these murids will have a hierarchy. So if the wali dies, the senior most murid will become the wali. Right? Uh, gradually they became very, very affluent as well because a lot of people started giving, uh, you know, the kings started giving them a lot of uh, money. Tributes as well flowed in. And they became very important. They became very important players. In fact, their relics came to be venerated in so many countless dargah, which we can see spread throughout the subcontinent. Right? So I'm just about to show you a map. Uh, uh, these are your uh, primary 10, 12 uh, uh, Sufi order. In India, the most dominant is Chishti. This is how the Sufi orders spread in this time period. Mid of 12th to 1400, this is how the 12 Sufi orders emerged in different cities. Naqshbandi Yahaparaya. Chisht, do you notice there's a small village called as Chisht. Right? From there came in, uh, you know, uh, it, was, it was near Hera. And from there came in uh, Muinuddin Chishti and he establishes the Chishti order. Right, there is Suhra Vardi, there is uh, Chishti, of course, there is Nakshabandi. These are few of the ones which are going to be important for us. The first eminent Sufi to settle down in India. The first eminent Sufi to settle down in India is Data Ganj Baksh, 11th century, from Ghazna. He was from Ghazna and he settled here in India and he is known as patron saint of Lahore, Data Ganj Baksh. He is also known for writing the Kashf Al Mahjub. What is this? This is the oldest Persian book on Sufism. Oldest Persian book on Sufism, written by Data, Gan Data Ganjabaksh, who settled here in India at Lahore. Right? Moving on. The first Khanka, first Khanka of the subcontinent was established by Bahauddin. Zakaria, Sheikh Bahauddin Zakaria. He is considered as the person who introduced Suhra Vardi order in the subcontinent. Do you see Suhra Vardi? It was established here, brought inside India by Bahauddin Zakaria. 
And he, these, uh, these Suhravardis, they believed in playing a very active political role. And they were also very aggressive into the entire task of proselytization, conversion. Chishtis were not that very aggressive. Suhravardis were very aggressive. Right? Uh, Shah Jalal, this is another Suhra Vardi saint that I want to talk about. Shah Jalal, although he comes slightly later, he will come into the 14th century as you can see. Right? He was also from Suhra Vardi uh, or Silsila. He came to India, was not able to achieve much in Delhi. Delhi may because the Chishtis were dominating. And so what he did was, he went to Bengal. And there he started uh, his khanka and opened, uh, you know, uh, langars at Lucknow, Pandua, these, these cities. And he played a very critical role in the conquest of Silha. He asked his murids, to go and expand Islam in the entire region, the entire region of Bengal. And no surprise, the international airport at Dhaka is known as Shah Jalal Airport, indicating the amount of relevance this guy holds in the region, Shah Jalal. Okay, uh, this is Moinuddin Chishti, also known as Khwaza Garib Nawaz. He came from a village called as Chisht near Herat, right? And he uh, came to India in 1206 and settled at Ajmer, right? He dies in 1236. And by the time of his death, within 30 years, he managed to you know, open several khankas across Delhi Sultanate. He kai khanka, chishti khanka, within the Sultanate. Nizam, this is, this is Moinuddin Chishti, also known as the Khwaza Garib Nawaz. Where you go and you know do that chadar thing. It's because of this Khwaza Garib Nawaz. And by the way, uh, just an additional information. Urs celebrates the death anniversary of a Sufi saint. Urs. Right. It uh, commemorates. I shouldn't say probably celebrate. It commemorates the death anniversary of a Sufi saint. Um, another very important uh, Chishti saint is the uh, Hazrat Khwaza Hamiduddin Nagori. His name was Hamiduddin. He established a, a Chishti center at Nagor, Rajasthan in 13th century. Right? He was a disciple of Muinuddin. He had no political role. He did not play any political role. Whenever he got a lot of money as charity, he would immediately distribute it among poors. Lived like an ordinary farmer. Did not eat meat. The earliest poet to use Hindavi, even earlier than uh, Amir Husru, is Hamiduddin Nagori. A prominent Sufi saint, Chishti Sufi saint from Rajasthan. So, uh, uh, you know, try and understand. Moinuddin Chishti established several Chishti centers. One of the Chishti center was in Delhi. Delhi's Chishti center became very powerful under Bakhtiyar Kaki. Kutubuddin Bakhtiyar Kaki. He was very popular and as a result, the Chishti center at Delhi became very powerful. Kutub Minar, that in itself is a testimony to the popularity of Bhaktiyar Kaki. 
isn't it? Bhakti Arkaki, he also dies in 1236. He also dies in 1236. Right? Kaki, after he dies, his spiritual successor is Fariduddin Ganj Shakar. So he is the one who now, uh, you know, takes his place. He is his successor. Better known as Baba Farid. Instead of shifting to uh, Delhi center, he decided to shift to Ajodhan, which is modern day Pak, Patan in Pakistan. So he decided to shift to Ajodhan and stayed uh, there. But he was very, very well known. He was very well known. And he held a lot of, uh, you know, social respect. The Badshah, the kings, everybody respected him. Right? Uh, his verse, his poems, they are a part of Ahadi Granth. Right? The collection of, uh, you know, Guru's teachings in Sikhism. Delhi became real Chishti center because of Baba Farid's successor. After Baba Farid, the next person who comes from, you know, who dominates the Chishti order is Nizamuddin Olia, and he reaches Delhi. He's not operating from outside Delhi. Right? This is his timeline. And he became the center, he became the focus for Muslims all over the subcontinent. He became the key spiritual figure in the entire northern India for Muslims. Nizamuddin Olia, including Amir Khusro. Amir Khusro was a huge disciple of Nizamuddin Olia. This is Nizamuddin Olia, this is Amir Khusro. Zamuddin, of course, you know, the railway station in Delhi. One of the railway stations is called Hazrat Nizamuddin railway station. Uh, Nasiruddin Chirag Tehlavi. He is the successor of Aulia. Once Aulia dies, Chirag Tehlavi comes in. He is considered as the last of important Chishti saint. Last of important Chishti saint from Delhi. Chishti order survives. But Delhi said, now there will not be any such a big name coming in, coming up. Nothing to match these guys, right? Uh, another Chishti saint that you should be aware of is the Banda Nawaz, Gesu Daraz. Right? Banda Nawaz, Gesu Daraz. He, in around 1400, he left Delhi because of, you know, Timur. And uh, went to Dawlatabha on the invitation of uh, uh, Bahamanid uh, Sultan. And there, Gesu Daraz established his Khanka. And he is considered as responsible for introducing Islam into the Deccan. Right? His name is Banda Nawaz Gesu Daraz. He settled at Gulbarga. As the Sultanate disintegrated, as the Sultanate disintegrated, so many provincial Sultanates emerged. And these Chishti saints now had so many more patrons. They had so many more patrons. There were several Sufi practices which made them feel very, very uh, at ease in the subcontinent. Right? They believed in Bahadat ul Wajud, that means unity of existence, this phenomena was given by Ibn Arbi. Ibn Arbi also argued that all are one and God is immanent in the creation and transcendental of the creation. That means it is a part as well as beyond the, its creation, the creator. This ideology, this philosophy, right, it mirrors very closely with the Nath yogis, followers of Gorakhnath, Siddh, the Kanfata yogis, all these wonderful terms which, frankly speaking, I do not have enough knowledge at this stage. 
right? But they do exist in medieval times and they play some very interesting role. Hopefully, if you have ever understood them in life, you will definitely understand them. So, similarities with the Nath Yogis, Kanfata, Siddh, etc. And these Sufis, they practiced Paase, Anfaas, controlled breathing. They would breathe very, very in a measurable way, just like a yogi practice. Then they would also involve in chilla a makus, 40 days of hardcore ascetic exercises, which will involve standing upside down, etc. Right? So all this, you know, you can understand it that this must have been very, very similar to the sort of ascetic practices which would go on in India as well. A lot of these, uh, you know, Nath Yogis, the Kanfatas, they rubbed the shoulders with these great Sufi saints. They were invited, they were a regular part of the Khanka, where wonderful musical gatherings will take place. Sama Bandh Diya Jayega. And increasingly, Persian and Arabic will be left alone and Hindavi will be adopted. Hindavi will be used. People such as Nizamuddin Aulia, they, you know, they immediately adopted Indian culture and tradition. Right? So this concept of Sama as well was very interesting. Where music was supposed to play a very important role. Right? to give you that, uh, to make you enter into that trance-like state where you're just closed with your divinity and uh, you start, you know, right? So Persian poetry, this is uh, Sant Gorakhnath and the Kanfata Yogis. Uh, the, so the Persian uh, poetry began to be relegated. Hindavi poetry with its all the imagery and references of Shiva and Vishnu Murli, Radha, all that started coming into uh, the Sufi poetry. And that Sufism has had a profound role on the nature of Indo Indian Islam. And that is why Indian Islam is so much more, why, you know, uh, full of vitality and so much more different than the global counterpart, than the global counterpart. Uh, a couple of minor orders, I would just like to mention them as well because they do play some important role. Uh, ek Shatari order established kiya gaya tha bachu. This was established by Abdullah Shatari, right? And uh, it was uh, operational in Bengal and Jaunpur, had an important role in the development of poetry. And Humayu, the Mughals, they were... Uh, you know, uh, the, their patron Sufi saints were the Nakshbandi of Bukhara, Central Asia. But Humayu, Humayu, he patronized the Shatari order. And the Nakshbandis did not like it. The Turanis, the Turks did not like it. They said, what is it? Nakshbandis, Sufi saints were, you know, under Akbar, Nakshbandis were dominant. Nakshbandi, Sufi saints, right? This is uh, another very, you know, interesting Sufi silsila which emerges in 16th century. It is called as Kadiri order. It dominates Punjab and Sindh. And there are just two names that you need to remember here. One is, of course, the most important. This is Mia Mir. Mia Mir. 1550 to 1635. That means he was very active during the time of uh, uh, Jahangir and Shah Jahan. He taught that there cannot be any difference between believer and the Kafir. Such differences he disregarded. Right? His spiritual successor was Mullah Shah. And this fellow, Mullah Shah, he was the spiritual mentor of Dara Shikoh and Jahan Nara. Dara Shikoh and Jahan Nara. So Mullah Shah, right? He was the spiritual mentor of Dara Shikoh. Dara Shikoh, of course, the younger brother of, 
Aurangzeb, whom Aurangzeb had tortured and uh, murdered. This, this fellow, uh, Dara Shikoh, uh, he must have, you know, uh, Mullah Shah must have had a very profound influence on Dara Shikoh because Dara Shikoh is the guy who wrote this beautiful book, Majmu'ul Bahrain, also known as the Samudra Sangam, where he talks about and compares Hindu mysticism and Islamic mysticism and says that how they are so much, you know, there are so many affinities between the two. So the, these are a list, uh, a set of, uh, uh, you know, uh, people, Sufi saints, which I believe that you must know. They are within the ambit of uh, our beautiful culture and you should know their contribution. God bless you. Uh, watch the space, like, comment, subscribe, man, come on. I hope you're liking all the content here. I hope uh, you're following it. And if you are, uh, uh, then, uh, you know, give me a five. Okay? Take care. Have fun. And uh, see you around. Bye.